Welcome to this morning's briefing, uh, Latino Entrepreneurship and the American Dream. I'd like to start by thanking our sponsor, Wells Fargo, for making this program possible. Across the United States, Latinos are becoming entrepreneurs at a faster rate than any other ethnic uh, group in the country, creating a million new businesses every five years, according to researchers. And yet Latino business owners face significant challenges when it comes to looking for capital and a skilled workforce. This morning, we look forward to taking a deep dive on what leaders in government and industry are doing to bridge this gap. We'll tackle how barriers to lending, training, and growth can be eliminated and the role of mentorship in empowering millennial Latino entrepreneurs. Before we begin, a few housekeeping notes. In addition to our audience here, we are live streaming on thehill.com slash events. Please keep your phones on silent, but we do encourage you to engage in the discussion on social media, following at the Hill events on Twitter, and comment using the hashtag LatinoSmallBiz. We're going to be taking questions from the audience, uh, so please be on the lookout for members of our team with handheld mics. And finally, there's a short feedback survey at, the, uh, at each of your chairs. We'd love to hear from you about our events, so please, um, and I encourage you to fill out the survey and turn it in at the end of the program. So let's dive right in. We begin this morning with Congressman Carlos Curbelo. He brings his own experience as a small business owner to the House and uh, sorry to the House Ways and Means Committee. Since joining the House of Representatives in 2014, the congressman has been an advocate for entrepreneurs. And in 2015, he introduced legislation that required senior government officials to uphold certain goals related to subcontracting subcontracting with small businesses. Welcome, Congressman Corbello. And joining uh, the congressman on stage is my colleague, The Hill's Editor-in-Chief, Bob Cusack. Bob, the floor is yours. Thanks, Diana. Thanks, Congressman, for, Thank for joining us. Um, first of all, you, you started your own media relations firm. Um, so what did you learn from that experience and bringing it to Washington and really what people in D.C., the D.C. policymakers, should learn uh, from your experience of starting your own firm. So first of all, thank you. This is a, a wonderful event celebrating uh, Latino entrepreneurship. And uh, congratulations, because uh, you run a great operation. Your reporters are everywhere <laughs> on the Hill, and they're very persistent. Thank you. Don't tell them that, though. So, <laughs> so um, my, my uh, firm started, I, I did a lot of Spanish language campaigns for uh, some uh, people who are in public office, for hospitals, for uh, developers and others. And I would say that, uh, you know, the, the Latino entrepreneurial spirit is there. And uh, we see it in Miami at a, every corner, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but I think what most of us uh, need the most help with is compliance, filing taxes, you know, all the uh, all the little things that can really be obstacles and that could get you in trouble if you don't get them right. Uh, so I think that coming from that background, uh, you know, gave me a little bit of an advantage here, obviously, in terms of messaging and, and public and media relations for sure, but also in understanding uh, what are the unique challenges? What, uh, what, what is it that, that people who are trying to uh, be entrepreneurial to to start uh, a business. What are the challenges um, that they face? Um, you voted for the tax law. What are you hearing from constituents? Obviously, no Democrat voted for it. Some Republicans, a few of them that didn't vote for it. Um, but how that impacts small businesses? Critics say it helps large firms more than small firms. There's just a lot of optimism uh, in the economy. And look. I always, when, when we start talking about the tax bill, I always want to focus on the economy first because every piece of legislation these days is politicized, right? So uh, let, let's uh, focus on what I think everyone can agree on. The economy is growing. Unemployment uh, is at a record low. Uh, unemployment among Hispanics, African Americans is also at a record low. So it is a really good time economically in our country. Now, I'm not going to sit up here and say, well, that's thanks uh, to our tax bill exclusively. Of course not. We know that 
Uh, there are a lot of different things that brought us to this point, but without question, uh, uh, the tax reform bill has pushed the economic recovery deeper into our society. And a lot of Americans, uh, I would say a lot of uh, Americans from minority groups especially, who felt left out of the economic recovery for so many years, are now starting to uh, experience it and appreciate it. And that is wonderful news. And when it comes to entrepreneurship, we know that this sentiment of optimism is so critical because when people feel confident, they're more likely to take risks. And I'm seeing this in my community. We've had roundtables. We go out and meet with small businesses. And everyone tells us things are getting better. Uh, we may actually hire someone else. Uh, we may try to open up a new store. And that's, that's just good for everyone. So that's something to celebrate. And anyone who contests that the tax bill is a part of that story, I don't think is being sincere. President Trump has touted uh, the unemployment rate, specifically the Hispanic uh, uh, unemployment rate, which is at 4.6. You mentioned it's the lowest ever. How much credit does President Trump deserve for that? I'm, I'm always hesitant to give any president uh, credit for creating jobs, uh, especially knowing how cyclical uh, uh, the economy is. But we all know that, that this is how it ends up, right? Uh, whoever was in office takes the credit, and it's usually the president, even if the Congress did write the tax bill. Uh, you know, it, it, it's always the president's tax bill or the president's stimulus bill or the president's health care bill, whatever it is. So, right. uh, look, I think we just need to be uh, realistic in terms of how our economy works and what's the role of the Congress, what's the role of the Federal Reserve, and uh, really what's the role of every individual American, which is what really makes, makes this economy go. Uh, but sure, I mean, I, I think whoever's in office uh, can claim sure. some credit, and that, that's fine. You, you've been a leader on pushing your party on immigration reform. Uh, there was a, a big effort, and it led to two bills hitting the House floor, but both failed. So what now? So uh, Patrick McHenry has a great line about I never asked him if I could use this publicly, but I've now said right it a ahead. few times. He, <laughs> he talks about the mystery math of immigration uh, policy. So you take two concepts that are fairly popular among the American public, a, 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 a path to legalization citizenship for, for dreamers, for young immigrants brought to our country as children. That's about an 80 percent issue in our country. And then increased border security. I know once you talk about a border wall, that gets a little more controversial. But most Americans will tell you that, yes, they believe we need to do more uh, to secure the border, maybe a 70, 75 percent issue. You put them together, and it gets about 30 percent of the votes in the U.S. House of Representatives. How does that happen? Well, it's the reason immigration hasn't gotten done uh, for at least 13 years, right, when George W. Bush first started this conversation. And if you talk about DREAMers, it goes all the way back to 2001, when the first DREAM Act was filed in Congress. And the problem is too many of our colleagues in Congress on both sides prefer the politics of immigration uh, rather than the solutions for immigration. And there's always a good excuse for some of our colleagues, or for most of our colleagues, to vote uh, yes on an immigration bill. I thought the bill uh, we put together, and I understand that our, our Democratic colleagues were not at the table for that uh, uh, for that discussion, but we were trying to find consensus among Republicans yep. first. But what we ended up putting on the floor was a bipartisan bill, and the evidence is that 121 Republicans voted for it and 112 of them voted against it. I guarantee you that wasn't because the bill was too conservative. It was because it was a fairly centrist bill. And I regret the fact that a minority of Republicans joined every Democrats to sink a bill that included path to citizenship for two million young immigrants brought to our country, increased border security, ended the policy of uh, separating uh, children from their parents at the border permanently, meaning no administration could ever do that again, and uh, had some other important reforms in terms of uh, our asylum system and making sure that it's there to help those uh, who truly are seeking asylum in our country. So this issue isn't going away, and we have to keep trying. We know there's some court decisions on the horizon that could right. again force action in Congress. What we try to do through our discharge petition, Bob, is recreate that pressure that the administration had uh, created uh, last year when the DACA program was canceled and, and the president asked Congress to act. A court decision kind of 
relieved some pressure from Congress. We recreated it and forced House Republican leaders. I think if two or three months ago someone would have told you mm -hmm. or anyone here, House Republican leaders will bring an immigration bill to the floor of the House that includes a pathway to citizenship for two million young immigrants brought to our country as children, most people would say no way. Yeah. And if I were to tell you after that that a majority of Republicans would support such legislation, I think a lot of people would have been skeptical too. We achieved that, of course we fell short of our goal, which was to pass a bill, but I think that what we did really brought us uh, closer uh, to uh, getting immigration reform done than we have ever uh, been before. The, the biggest issue right now, at least among progressives, uh, on immigration is, is a big push to abolish ICE. Uh, do you think that's a solution? No, and it's evidence of the increasing polarization in our politics. Each side wants to kind of outdo the other. And I thought this, uh, you know, Jeff Sessions' policy of uh, using family separation as a deterrent was so ill-conceived, so nasty, really. And I, I thought it was a perfect reason for the president to finally dismiss Jeff Sessions, something that it appears he's been wanting to do for a while. I actually uh, encouraged him to do that at the time. And what's the response to that policy rather than, well, let's end that and sure, let's, let's try to uh, curtail some of the asylum uh, abuse uh, mm -hmm. that we see at our border? No, that's not the answer. The answer is we have to end all law enforcement when it comes to immigration policy. And that's what abolish ICE uh, abolishing ICE would essentially do, and that's reckless and irresponsible and disrespectful to men and women in uniform who are trying to keep Americans safe. Now, of course, we know that, that most of the people who come across our border just want to work and, and want a better life, uh, but a lot of people who come across our border are drug and human traffickers and, and very dangerous people, and, and the men and women of ICE need to protect us from those people and also uh, need to enforce our border. I tell people, you know, I'm a pro uh, immigrant advocate, but I do believe that our country has the right and the responsibility to secure its borders just like every other country in the world does, including our Mexican and Canadian neighbors. We're going to open up for questions. Um, so if you have a question, please raise your hand and identify yourself. And if you can wait, we have, uh, we have some people with uh, a mic uh, because we're live streaming on thehill.com. That's a head fake question. Um, Okay, well, we're serving coffee, right? Uh, there's one over here. here. <laughs> Good morning, Congressman. Uh, John Bird with the National Society of Professional Surveyors, NSPS. Wanted to commend you for your uh, co-sponsorship, uh, an important bill to your coastal community and to the Latino business community called the Digital Coast Act, uh, H.R. 4062. And can you talk about Ports Harbor's infrastructure, what small business owners are dealing with coastal resiliency, sustainability, especially with hurricane season, and maybe based on your background with the Small Business Committee, uh, what kind of resources are available for the SBA for them? Well, there's a lot there, but it's all very important. And in terms of port infrastructure, I'll tell you, we're blessed in, uh, in Miami. We uh, dredge the port uh, for it to uh, be capable of receiving the post-Panamax vessels some years ago. And I think still today, it's the only port south of Norfolk on the eastern coast of the United States that can receive these vessels. So it's been wonderful for our local economy. I'm a big believer in international trade. That's not popular these days, but this Republican still believes in, in, in the ability of trade to, to create wealth and more jobs and opportunities for, for all of us in this country, as long as we do it right. Uh, in terms of coastal resiliency, uh, sea level rise is a major concern for my district. I tell people, you know, for, for many uh, throughout the country, this climate change, sea level rise discussion is theoretical and you get in a classroom and talk about it. For us, uh, most people in our community live uh, at about sea level and near the sea. So this is not a, a, a theoretical uh, exercise. It's actually a real concern. And something that I think the federal government must do urgently within the next few years is start dedicating some of our infrastructure funding to coastal communities to make sure that we can protect coastal communities from saltwater intrusion, sea level rise. I'll give you an idea of what that looks like in South Florida. The Everglades houses our freshwater drinking supply, right? Uh, if we see uh, saltwater intrusion uh, into the Everglades, eventually that could threaten our ability to live in South Florida because we simply won't have enough, enough uh, quality fresh water for 
uh, the approximately uh, six to seven million people who live uh, in South Florida. So we need to do more uh, to invest uh, in coastal communities and in infrastructure. A city like Miami Beach has put about $500 million into a pump system. Florida Keys, which I represent, is starting to elevate roads. Uh, federal government is going to have to come in and uh, complement these efforts in the short term because these communities are economic drivers for the country. As you indicated, these are ports of entry. Tourists, visitors from all over the world uh, come to the United States through these communities and, and help expand and grow our economy. So uh, that's something I'm focused on. And in the coming weeks, uh, we're looking at filing a broader solution to address um, climate change, both mitigation and adaptation. So be on the lookout for that. You mentioned trade. Um, President Trump, we're basically in a trade war with, with China now. And we talked to a lot of Republicans who are very frustrated with the president's policies on trade and, and believe it's hindering uh, the economy. Uh, are you concerned with how he's handled trade? There's no question that uh, at least some of the trade policies the president has embraced, uh, embraced will hurt growth in our economy. There's no question. Now, uh, I, I like to be a little nuanced because when it comes to China, I think some of the uh, actions that the administration has taken are justified. We have known for many years uh, that the Chinese cheat and undermine the international trade system. They steal our intellectual property. If you're an American company and you want to go do business in China, you have to do it under their terms. Uh, they, uh, they, they force you to transfer your intellectual uh, property and uh, any trade secrets that you may have, and that's just wrong. And to have a president that is clearly standing up against that and holding the Chinese accountable, I think, is a good idea. Now, to pick a trade fight with Canada, with Mexico, uh, with our European allies, I don't think is a good idea. Trade works best when it's conducted, just like any business, right? You have a lot of entrepreneurs in this room. You want to do business with people who share your values, with people uh, who you trust. And I would uh, propose to the president that we can certainly trust the Canadians, we can certainly trust the Mexicans, and our European allies. That doesn't mean that they're perfect. That doesn't mean that we may not have some disputes and that, sure, we'd like to see some tariffs uh, uh, eliminated against, uh, against some of our products, but to start a trade war with these countries, to use national security as an excuse to uh, inhibit uh, trade with Canada, for example, I think is uh, a poor decision that is going to have a negative impact on our economy and offset some of those gains uh, from the tax bill that we discussed earlier. So I'm hopeful that over the summer, a lot of these trade disputes can be resolved. I think it'll be much easier to do that uh, with our regional and uh, European partners and with the Chinese. That'll take a little more time. We've run out of time for this session. Please thank Congressman Cabello for joining us this morning. Thank you all. Hey, thank you.